Section 14 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. Section 14. Selected Works by John Quincy Adams. 1767 to 1848. The chief distinction in character between John Adams and his son is the strangest one imaginable, when one remembers that to the fiery, combative, bristling Adams blood was added an equal strain from the gay, genial, affectionate Abigail Smith. The son, though of deep inner affections, and even hungering for good will if it would come without his help, was on the surface incomparably colder, harsher, and thornier than his father, with all the socially repellent traits of the race, and none of the softer ones. The father could never control his tongue or his temper, and not always his head. The son never lost the bridle of either, and much of his terrible power in debate came from his ability to make others lose theirs while perfectly keeping his own. The father had plenty of warm friends and allies. At the worst he worked with half a party. The son, in the most superb part of his career, had no friends, no allies, no party, except the group of constituents who kept him in Congress. The father's self-confidence deepened in the son to a solitary and even contemptuous gladiatorship against the entire government of the country for long years of hate and peril the father's irritable though generous vanity changed in the son to an icy contempt or white-hot scorn of nearly all around him the father's spasms of acrimonious judgment steadied in the son to a constant rancor always finding new objects but only john quincy adams could have done the work awaiting john quincy adams and each of his unamiable qualities strengthened his fibre to do it and if a man is to be judged by his fruits, Mr. Morse is justified in saying that he was not only preeminent in ability and acquirements, but even more to be honored for profound, immutable honesty of purpose and broad, noble humanity of aims. It might almost be said that the sixth president of the United States was cradled in statesmanship. Born July eleventh, 1767, he was a little lad of ten when he accompanied his father on the French mission. Eighteen months elapsed before he returned, and three months later he was again upon the water, bound once more for the French capital. There were school days in Paris, and other school days in Amsterdam and in Leiden, but the boy was only fourteen, the mature old child, when he went to St. Petersburg as private secretary and interpreter to Francis Dana, just appointed minister plenipotentiary to the court of the empress catherine such was his apprenticeship to a public career which began in earnest in seventeen ninety four and lasted with slight interruptions for fifty-four years minister to the united netherlands to russia to prussia and to england commissioner to frame the treaty of ghent which ended the war of eighteen twelve state senator united states senator secretary of state a position in which he made the treaty with spain which conceded florida and enunciated the monroe doctrine before monroe and far more thoroughly than he president and then for many years member of the national house of representatives it is strange to find this man writing in his later years my whole life has been a succession of disappointments i can scarcely recollect a single instance of success to anything that I ever undertook. It is true, however, that his successes and even his glories always had some bitter ingredient to spoil their flavor. As United States Senator he was practically boycotted for years, even by his own party members, because he was an Adams. In 1807 he definitely broke with the Federalist Party, for what he regarded as its slavish crouching under English outrages conduct which had been for years estranging him by supporting jefferson's embargo as better than no show of resistance at all and was for a generation denounced by the new england federalists as a renegade for the sake of office and a traitor to new england the massachusetts legislature practically censured him in eighteen o eight and he resigned 
His winning of the presidency brought pain instead of pleasure. He valued it only as a token of national confidence, got it only as a minority candidate in a divided party, and was denounced by the Jacksonians as a corrupt political bargainer. And his later congressional career, though his chief title to glory, was one long martyrdom, even though its worst pains were self-inflicted, and he never knew the immense victory he had actually won. The old man eloquent, after ceasing to be president, was elected in 1830 by his home district a representative in Congress, and regularly re-elected till his death. For a long time he bore the anti-slavery standard almost alone in the halls of Congress, a unique and picturesque figure, rousing every demon of hatred in his fellow members, in constant and envenomed battle with them, and more than a match for them all. He fought single-handed for the right of petition as an indefeasible right, not hesitating to submit a petition from citizens of Virginia, praying for his own expulsion from Congress as a nuisance. In 1836 he presented a petition from 158 ladies, citizens of Massachusetts, for, I said, I had not yet brought myself to doubt whether females were citizens. After eight years of persistent struggle against the Atherton Gag Law, which practically denied the right of petition in matters relating to slavery, he carried a vote rescinding it, and nothing of the kind was again enacted. He had a fatal stroke of paralysis on the floor of Congress, February 21st, 1848, and died two days later. As a writer he was perspicuous, vigorous, and straightforward. He had entered Harvard in the middle of the college course, and been graduated with honors. He had then studied and practiced law. He was professor of rhetoric and oratory at Harvard from 1806 to 1809, and was well drilled in the use of language, but was too downright in his temper and purposes to spend much labor upon artistic effects. He kept an elaborate diary during the greater part of his life, since published in twelve volumes of memoirs by his son Charles Francis Adams, a vast storehouse of material relating to the political history of the country, but as published largely restricted to public affairs. He delivered orations on Lafayette, on Madison, on Monroe, on Independence, and on the Constitution, published essays on the Masonic Institution and various other matters, a report on weights and measures of enormous labor and permanent value, lectures on rhetoric and oratory, a tale in verse on the conquest of Ireland with the title Dermot MacMorrow, an account of travels in Silesia, and a volume of poems of religion and society. He had some facility in rhyme, but his judgment was not at fault in informing him that he was not a poet. Mr. Morse says that no man can have been more utterly void of a sense of humor or an appreciation of wit, and yet he very fairly anticipated Holmes in his poem on The Wants of Man, and hits rather neatly on a familiar foible in the verse with which he begins Dermot MacMorrow. Tis strange how often readers will indulge their wits a mystic meaning to discover, secrets ne'er dreamt of by the bard divulge, and where he shoots a cluck will find a plover. Satiric shafts from every line promulge, detect a tyrant where he draws a lover. Nay, so intent his hidden thoughts to see, cry, if he paint a scoundrel, that means me. Letter to his father, at the age of ten. Dear sir, I love to receive letters very well, much better than I love to write them. I make but a poor figure at composition, my head is too fickle, my thoughts are running after birds' eggs, play, and trifles, till I get vexed with myself. Mamma has a troublesome task to keep me steady, and I own I am ashamed of myself. I have but just entered the third volume of Smollett, though I had designed to have got it half through by this time. I have determined this week to be more diligent, as Mr. Thaxter will be absent at court, and I cannot pursue my other studies. I have set myself a stent and determined to read the third volume half out. If I can but keep my resolution, I will write again at the end of the week and give a better account of myself. I wish, sir, you would give me some instructions with regard to my time, and advise me how to proportion my studies and my play in writing, and I will keep them by me and endeavor to follow them. 
I am, dear sir, with a present determination of growing better, yours. P.S. Sir, if you will be so good as to favor me with a blank book, I will transcribe the most remarkable occurrences I meet with in my reading, which will serve to fix them upon my mind. From the Memoirs at the Age of Eighteen April 26, 1785 a letter from Mr. Gary of February 25th says that Mr. Adams is appointed minister to the Court of London. I believe he will promote the interests of the United States as much as any man, but I fear his duty will induce him to make exertions which may be detrimental to his health. I wish, however, it may be otherwise. Were I now to go with him, probably my immediate satisfaction might be greater than it will be in returning to America after having been travelling for these seven years almost all over europe and having been in the world and among company for three to return to spend one or two years in the pale of a college subjected to all the rules which i have so long been freed from then to plunge into the dry and tedious study of the law for three years and afterwards not expect however good an opinion i may have of myself to bring myself into notice under three or four years more if ever it is really a prospect somewhat discouraging for a youth of my ambition for i have ambition though i hope its object is laudable but still oh how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes favors or on those of anybody else i am determined that so long as i shall be able to get my own living in an honorable manner i will depend upon no one my father has been so much taken up all his lifetime with the interests of the public that his own fortune has suffered by it so that his children will have to provide for themselves which i shall never be able to do if i loiter away my precious time in europe and shun going home until i am forced to it with an ordinary share of common sense which i hope i enjoy at least in america i can live independent and free and rather than live otherwise i would wish to die before the time when i shall be left at my own discretion i have before me a striking example of the distressing and humiliating situation a person is reduced to by adopting a different line of conduct and i am determined not to fall into the same error from the memoirs january fourteenth eighteen thirty one I received a letter from John C. Calhoun, now Vice President of the United States, relating to his present controversy with President Jackson and William H. Crawford. He questions me concerning the letter of General Jackson to Mr. Monroe, which Crawford alleges to have been produced at the Cabinet meetings on the Seminole War, and asks for copies, if I think proper to give them, of Crawford's letter to me which I received last summer, and of my answer. I answered Mr. Calhoun's letter immediately, rigorously confining myself to the direct object of his inquiries. This is a new bursting out of the old and rancorous feud between Crawford and Calhoun, both parties to which, after suspending their animosities and combining them together to effect my ruin, are appealing to me for testimony to sustain themselves each against the other. This is one of the occasions upon which I shall eminently need the direction of a higher power to guide me in every step of my conduct. I see my duty to discard all consideration of their treatment of me, to adhere in everything that I shall say or write to the truth, to assert nothing positively of which I am not absolutely certain, to deny nothing upon which there remains a scruple of doubt upon my memory, to conceal nothing which it may be lawful to divulge, and which may promote truth and justice between the parties. With these principles I see further the necessity for caution and prudence in the course I shall take. The bitter enmity of all three of the parties, Jackson, Calhoun, and Crawford, against me, an enmity the more virulent because kindled by their own ingratitude and injustice to me, the interest which every one of them, and all their partisans, have in keeping up that load of obloquy and public odium which their foul calumnies have brought down upon me, and the disfavor in which I stand before a majority of the people excited against me by their artifices, their demerits to me are proportioned to the obligations to me, Jackson's the greatest, Crawford's the next, Calhoun's the least of positive obligation, but darkened by his double-faced setting himself up as a candidate for the presidency against me in 1821, 
his prevarications between jackson and me in eighteen twenty four and his icy hearted dereliction of all the decencies of social intercourse with me solely from the terror of jackson since the fourth of march eighteen twenty nine i walk between burning ploughshares let me be mindful where i place my foot from the memoirs june seventh eighteen thirty three the first seedling apple tree that i had observed on my return here just out of the ground was on the twenty second of april it had grown slowly but constantly since and had put out five or six leaves last evening after my return from boston i saw it perfectly sound this morning i found it broken off leaving one lobe of the seed leaves and one leaf over it this may have been the work of a bug or perhaps of a caterpillar it would not be imaginable to any person free from hobby horse or fanciful attachments how much mortification such an incident occasions st evremond after removing into the country returned to a city life because he found himself in despair for the loss of a pigeon his conclusion was that rural life induced exorbitant attachment to insignificant objects my experience is conformable to this my natural propensity was to raise trees fruit and forest from the seed i had it in early youth but the course of my life deprived me of the means of pursuing the bent of my inclination one shell bark walnut tree in my garden the root of which i planted eighth october eighteen o four and one mazard cherry tree in the grounds north of the house the stone of which i planted about the same time are the only remains of my experiments of so ancient a date had my life been spent in the country and my experiments commenced while i was at college i should now have a large fruit garden flourishing orchards of native fruit and very valuable forests instead of which i have a nursery of about half an acre of ground half full of seedlings from five years to five days old bearing for the first time perhaps twenty peaches and a few blossoms of apricots and cherries and hundreds of seedlings of the present year perishing from day to day before my eyes from the memoirs september ninth eighteen thirty three cold and cloudy day clearing off toward evening in the multitudinous whimsies of a disabled mind and body the thick coming fancies often come to me that the events which affect my life and adventures are specially shaped to disappoint my purposes my whole life has been a succession of disappointments i can scarcely recollect a single instance of success to anything that i ever undertook yet with fervent gratitude to god i confess that my life has been equally marked by great and signal successes which i neither aimed at nor anticipated fortune by which i understand providence has showered blessings upon me profusely but they have been blessings unforeseen and unsought non nobis domine non nobis sed nomini tuo da gloriam i ought to have been taught by it three lessons one of implicit reliance upon providence two of humility and humiliation the thorough conviction of my own impotence to accomplish anything three of resignation and not to set my heart upon anything which can be taken from me or denied the mission of america from his fourth of july oration at washington eighteen twenty one and now friends and countrymen if the wise and learned philosophers of the older world the first observers of nutation and aberration the discoverers of maddening ether and invisible planets the inventors of congreve rockets and shrapnel shells should find their hearts disposed to inquire what has america done for mankind let our answer be this america with the same voice which spoke herself into existence as a nation proclaimed to mankind the inextinguishable rights of human nature and the only lawful foundations of government america in the assembly of nations since her admission among them has invariably though often fruitlessly held forth to them the hand of honest friendship of equal freedom of generous reciprocity she has uniformly spoken among them though often to heedless and often to disdainful ears the language of equal liberty equal justice and equal rights 
she has in the lapse of nearly half a century without a single exception respected the independence of other nations while asserting and maintaining her own she has abstained from interference in the concerns of others even when the conflict has been for principles to which she clings as to the last vital drop that visits the heart she has seen that probably for centuries to come all the contests of that aceldama the european world will be contests between inveterate power and emerging right wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled there will her heart her benedictions and her prayers be but she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy she is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all she is the champion and vindicator only of her own she will recommend the general cause by the countenance of her voice and the benignant sympathy of her example she well knows that by once enlisting under other banners than her own were they even the banners of foreign independence she would involve herself beyond the power of extrication in all the wars of interest and intrigue of individual avarice envy and ambition which assume the colors and usurp the standard of freedom the fundamental maxims of her policy would insensibly change from liberty to force the frontlet upon her brows would no longer beam with the ineffable splendor of freedom and independence but in its stead would soon be substituted an imperial diadem flashing in false and tarnished luster the murky radiance of dominion and power she might become the dictatress of the world she would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit the right of petition quoted in memoir by josiah quincy sir it is well known that from the time i entered this house down to the present day i have felt it a sacred duty to present any petition couched in respectful language from any citizen of the united states be its object what it may be the prayer of it that in which i could concur or that to which i was utterly opposed i adhere to the right of petition and let me say here that let the petition be as the gentleman from virginia has stated from free negroes prostitutes as he supposes for he says there is one put on this paper and he infers that the rest are of the same description that has not altered my opinion at all where is your law that says that the mean the low and the degraded shall be deprived of the right of petition if their moral character is not good where in the land of free men was the right of petition ever placed on the exclusive basis of morality and virtue petition is supplication it is entreaty it is prayer and where is the degree of vice or immorality which shall deprive the citizen of the right to supplicate for a boon or to pray for mercy where is such a law to be found it does not belong to the most abject despotism there is no absolute monarch on earth who is not compelled by the constitution of his country to receive the petitions of his people whosoever they may be the sultan of constantinople cannot walk the streets and refuse to receive petitions from the meanest and vilest in the land this is the law even of despotism and what does your law say does it say that before presenting a petition you shall look into it and see whether it comes from the virtuous and the great and the mighty no sir it says no such thing the right of petition belongs to all and so far from refusing to present a petition because it might come from those low in the estimation of the world it would be an additional incentive if such an incentive were wanting nullification from his fourth of july oration at quincy eighteen thirty one nullification is the provocation to that brutal and foul contest of force which has hitherto baffled all the efforts of the european and southern american nations to introduce among them constitutional governments of liberty and order it strips us of that peculiar and unimitated characteristic of all our legislation free debate it makes the bayonet the arbiter of law it has no argument but the thunderbolt it were senseless to imagine that twenty-three states of the union would suffer their laws to be trampled upon by the despotic mandate of one the act of nullification would itself be null and void force must be called in to execute the law of the union force must be applied by the nullifying state to resist its execution eighty hot from hell cries havoc and let slip the dogs of war the blood of brethren is shed by each other 
the citizen of the nullifying state is a traitor to his country by obedience to the law of his state a traitor to his state by obedience to the law of his country the scaffold and the battlefield stream alternately with the blood of their victims let this agent but once intrude upon your deliberations and freedom will take her flight for heaven the declaration of independence will become a philosophical dream and uncontrolled despotic sovereignties will trample with impunity through a long career of after ages at interminable or exterminating war with one another upon the indefeasible and unalienable rights of man the event of a conflict of arms between the union and one of its members whether terminating in victory or defeat would be but an alternative of calamity to all in the holy records of antiquity we have two examples of a confederation ruptured by the severance of its members one of which resulted after three desperate battles in the extermination of the seceding tribe and the victorious people instead of exulting in shouts of triumph came to the house of god and abode there till even before god and lifted up their voices and wept sore and said o lord god of israel why is this come to pass in israel that there should be to-day one tribe lacking in israel the other was a successful example of resistance against tyrannical taxation and severed forever the confederacy the fragments forming separate kingdoms and from that day their history presents an unbroken series of disastrous alliances and exterminating wars of assassinations conspiracies revolts and rebellions until both parts of the confederacy sunk in tributary servitude to the nations around them till the countrymen of david and solomon hung their harps upon the willows of babylon and were totally lost among the multitudes of the chaldean and assyrian monarchies the most despised portion of their slaves in these mournful memorials of their fate we may behold the sure too sure prognostication of our own from the hour when force shall be substituted for deliberation in the settlement of our constitutional questions this is the deplorable alternative the extirpation of the seceding member or the never-ceasing struggle of two rival confederacies ultimately bending the neck of both under the yoke of foreign domination or the despotic sovereignty of a conqueror at home may heaven avert the omen the destinies of not only our posterity but of the human race are at stake let no such melancholy forebodings intrude upon the festivities of this anniversary serene skies and balmy breezes are not congenial to the climate of freedom progressive improvement in the condition of man is apparently the purpose of a superintending providence that purpose will not be disappointed in no delusion of national vanity but with a feeling of profound gratitude to the god of our fathers let us indulge the cheering hope and belief that our country and her people have been selected as instruments for preparing and maturing much of the good yet in reserve for the welfare and happiness of the human race much good has already been effected by the solemn proclamation of our principles much more by the illustration of our example the tempest which threatens desolation may be destined only to purify the atmosphere it is not in tranquil ease and enjoyment that the active energies of mankind are displayed toils and dangers are the trials of the soul doomed to the first by his sentence at the fall man by his submission converts them into pleasures the last are since the fall the condition of his existence to see them in advance to guard against them by all the suggestions of prudence to meet them with the composure of unyielding resistance and to abide with firm resignation the final dispensation of him who rules the ball these are the dictates of philosophy these are the precepts of religion these are the principles and consolations of patriotism these remain when all is lost and of these is composed the spirit of independence the spirit embodied in that beautiful personification of the poet which may each of you my countrymen to the last hour of his life apply to himself thy spirit independence let me share lord of the lion heart and eagle eye thy steps i follow with my bosom bare nor heed the storm that howls along the sky in the course of nature the voice which now addresses you must soon cease to be heard upon earth life and all which it inherits 
lose of their value as it draws toward its close but for most of you my friends and neighbors long and many years of futurity are yet in store may they be years of freedom years of prosperity years of happiness ripening for immortality but were the breath which now gives utterance to my feelings the last vital air i should draw my expiring words to you and your children should be independence and union forever End of section 14